a very good afternoon from everyone. That's not clear. We seem to be having a problem with that. Perhaps we'll come back to the African Union anthem a little bit later on. Ms. Tasneem Karima, I can hand the floor over to you and ask you to begin the presentations, please. Thank you very much, Singa. Uh, Nzinga, Program Director, members of the Foreign Correspondents Association and the distinguished guests, greetings to you all. Uh, firstly, let me apologize for uh, the absence of our Director General, Ms. Pumla Williams, and our Acting uh, Deputy Director General, Tyrone Seal. They really wanted to be here, uh, but it just so happens that uh, this webinar is taking place on the same day as the Cabinet Lakhotla, and unfortunately, uh, that does take first priority. Uh, but let me assure you, um, they really did want to be here and there is no way that they could have missed the important discussions taking place at the Cabinet Lakhotla. Secondly, let me say it's a great honor for me to open this webinar on the vaccine rollout plan in Africa. I would like to express my appreciation to all those who have made this important gathering possible. It comes at a very appropriate time as countries around the world race to prevent more deaths by accelerating the vaccination programs against the pandemic. As a South African government, we are pleased that safe and effective vaccines have been developed less than a year after the emergence of COVID-19. And as Dr. Mandi often reminds us, it's something that it's a major achievement that should be celebrated more. The development of these vaccines does give us hope that the African continent and the world will be able to bring the pandemic under control um, and, save, and save lives. While we welcome the development of the vaccines, we, as the president has reminded us, we should guard against vaccine nationalism or the monopolizing of the distribution of vaccines by well-developed countries. Many experts have warned us that equitable access to vaccines is in the best interest of everyone, and that failure to do so might prolong the pandemic by years. Putting an end to the pandemic will require greater collaboration on the rollout of vaccines, not less, and ensure that no country is left out on the life-saving power of vaccines. We therefore join in the call by the WHO to prioritize access to vaccines and treatments in line with international human rights principles. Program Director, as the continent prepares for its own COVID-19 vaccine rollout, we must also deal with fake news and misinformation which has spread across the world on the safety of vaccines. We hope the webinar will also get a chance to discuss this. We have a duty to protect the people of this continent from deliberate falsehoods, which are a danger to the rollout of a successful vaccination campaign. Also questions that have arisen are about the safety of the vaccine. And we believe that there's overwhelming scientific evidence that it, the vaccination is the best defense against serious infections. I myself am looking forward to uh, the presentations by the three doctors, which I think um, are very interesting and very convincing. Um, vaccines have reduced the morbidity and mortality of infectious diseases. We on the continent know better than anybody else the evidence of this. And I think today's discussion will help us uh, to um, also educate ourselves a little bit more on the successes of, of the vaccine programs. For example, the new Ebola vaccine, according to the WHO, which is being used to prevent the spread of the disease in the DRC, and also another vaccine for malaria, which is being piloted in three African countries. It's important that we assure the people about the safety of vaccines, in particular the COVID-19 one that we will be rolling out. The emergence of the new variant also makes it even more important for the continent to fast track the rollout of vaccines. 
The good news is that unlike when the first wave arrived, the continent now has a framework for coordination in place that has allowed us to deal decisively with the rapid spread of the pandemic. But we need your help. Some have expressed concern that the continent has been slow to secure vaccines or that vaccination will be, de will be delayed. We're convinced that the continent under the leadership of the African Union has over the past few months pulled out all the stops to ensure rapid and equitable rollout of vaccines for all. The COVID-19 African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team or ABAT, um, the establishment of ABAT has helped, will help ensure that African countries are able to access and distribute affordable and effective vaccines without, without delay. The task team, which was established earlier this year by the African Union Chair, President Cyril Ramaphosa, has already secured a provisional 270 million vaccine doses for African countries, with at least 50 million being available from April to June. All of these initiatives are a testament of the continent's commitment to ensure that all countries in the continent benefit from the life-saving power of vaccines. While the actual level needed for herd immunity is not known, as scientists estimate that the continent will be able to turn the tide uh, once around 60% of the population is immune. I'm also looking forward to having some kind of discussion on this view. South Africa has also put in place a comprehensive vaccination strategy to achieve immunity across our population through a massive program of vaccination. We're looking forward to hear Dr. Manzi talking a little bit about this and um, talking about how it's going to be rolled out. South Africa has to date secured 20 million doses to be delivered mainly in the first half of the year and is close to concluding promising negotiations with a number of different manufacturers. And we know that Dr. Manzi will give us more information about when we can expect to hear further announcements on this, on this matter. We have also developed criteria on who should be vaccinated first, given the fact that the supply of vaccine is limited. We believe that that vaccine should be made available to all South Africans, starting with frontline uh, healthcare workers and the most vulnerable, like the elderly. This criteria is in line with the recommendation of the WHO, and the vaccines will need to be made available quickly so that most of our citizens are covered by the end of the year. As the Minister of Health, Zweli Mkhize, has pointed out, we are targeting a minimum of 67% of the population to achieve herd immunity, and the approach will be a phased rollout. Let me conclude, uh, colleagues, by saying that the success in the development of vaccines have been breathtaking, but challenges still remain, particularly in ensuring that all countries benefit from them. A lot must also be done to dispel some misconceptions about the safety of vaccines and to ensure that the public make themselves available for this massive vaccination campaign. We are hopeful that with the help of various partners, such as the media, we will be able to solve the multiple and diverse challenges we are facing. With these few words, I welcome you once again to the GCIS webinar and wish you well in the discussions that will ensue today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karim, for your presentation. I'd like to now ask Dr. Loazi Manzi to come to the virtual floor and present for us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Zinka, and uh, a very good morning to everybody who is here this morning. Now, I just want to firstly just put an apology out there. We were actually supposed to have um, uh, Professor Lisana was going to take us through the um, rollout plan and my role was going to be talking more about communications. So 
but um, since uh, she's not, uh, she has not been able to uh, be here with us, I can just take everybody through a high level um, uh, sort of uh, just talk um, on the vaccines. And, and then I will do my presentation on the uh, communication that going forward, or let me, rather let me say communications ideas, because uh, we are struggling with communications and, and, and for the reasons that I will elaborate. And I think that as a continent, we all need to just come together and pull together and uh, ensure that even under the uh, uh, restrictions, we operate and that we are still able to get message to people. Now, last night we had a extensive webinar uh, on the phase one inoculation campaign. Um, and so I really hope that uh, many of the participants that were that are here today were there last night. But just to um, go back to um, what was discussed yesterday and, and just to put out some high level thoughts uh, on the uh, inoculation campaign. I think for the first part, what I want to say is that the campaign draws on the principles of universal health coverage. And I am sure that last night during the webinar, there was a lot of rhetoric that people recognized coming from the tenets of NHI, which is our iteration, which is the National Health Insurance, which is our iteration of, um, of, of, of universal health coverage. And what we have said is that, first of all, the inoculation campaign is a public good. Our fortunes are tied to one another. And therefore, it is imperative that the government leads uh, this initiative and, and that it is treated as a public good for all of our people to ensure that we extricate ourselves from the jaws of COVID-19 and reclaim our socioeconomic lives. So that's the first uh, important principle. And having said that, uh, as, as the minister's statement last night, the importance of that principle is that from the outset, the fiscus will be able to manage the entire process. Uh, it will be able to fund the entire process. If we didn't have help from anybody, we would, as government, fund the entire process and vaccinate everybody. In fact, it is going to be free at the point. Having said that, it is absolutely necessary as per the, excuse me, I'm sorry, as per the, um, uh, the Presidential Health Compact and the tenets of NHR to ensure that even though it is a government-led initiative, that it does necessarily inculcate um, a, a multi-sectoral collaboration. And this is very important as Tazneem has uh, alluded to, that it is extremely important that all the sectors are brought together um, as a whole of society project, because it is a whole of society project. It's a whole of society threat, and therefore it becomes a whole of society project. And therefore, that is why we saw last night that they were business partners, social partners, partners uh, from uh, the civil society, partners from professional bodies, etc., which showed their support. And they showed their support um, not just as a grandstanding exercise, but as an exercise of necessity. And we and and we, and it, and therefore we must then um, be able to articulate. Um, the manner in which this multi-sectoral collaboration is going to find expression on the ground. And so that's, that's, the second, that's the second aspect. The third aspect is the funding aspect. And um, there were very good comments actually in the, in the chat box last night, um, which uh, where, where people really did start to pick up that, hang on a minute, this is actually starting to look like an expression of our universal health coverage, and this is actually a beautiful thing. And in fact, um, does this not mean that we might as well then carry on on this path and um, accelerate our pathway towards universal health coverage? So indeed, what you're seeing in the funding model is you are seeing a funding model that essentially pools funds 
to ensure that there's a level of social solidarity between those who are funded and those who are not funded. Those funds being pooled, they, although they're not being pooled in the manner that is envisaged in the NHI, but they're certainly being pooled in, in, in principle, in that if you have medical aid, you, your medical aid is going to fund your vaccination and those funds are going to be reimbursed to the fiscus. And if you do not have medical aid, the fiscus is going to directly pay for you. But the principle being that the inoculation is going to be free at the point of care. And this is, of course, is what we are aiming towards, that all health care should be free at the point of care. So this is actually a wonderful dry run for universal health coverage, not only in this country, but in the continent. And, and we really uh, do look forward to seeing it being rolled out so that it becomes like a case study. And this case study uh, in, 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 in its success in rolling out should be something that we study as a continent uh, to see where we have, where we achieve, where there may be shortfalls and where we can improve on the systems. And then we can then scale up from there to ensure that the entire healthcare system finds a similar type of expression. So, um, so those are really uh, some of the, for me, some of the most exciting aspects um, of uh, this rollout strategy. We then said we, we that um, it being that it being that uh, there is a massive market, a massive demand for uh, vaccines in, in the global market. Um, everywhere in the world, we will be looking at a phased approach. Uh, therefore, we are ourselves embarking on a phased approach. And we have, uh, and I think everybody at this stage knows now that we have phase one, phase two, phase three, phase one being for healthcare workers. And we keep getting asked questions, which healthcare worker, any healthcare worker who is currently working in the system, actively working is considered a healthcare worker. And, and they may be foreign, they may be South African citizens, they may be students, uh, they may be different disciplines, they may be clinical, non-clinical, they may be uh, 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 so guards, porters, cleaners, anybody who is interacting with patients is considered a frontline healthcare worker and they will be prioritized first. Yes, of course, we can't do all 1.25 or the estimated 1.25 million at the same time. Therefore, there will be some kind of structure that will need to be instituted to ensure that we can roll this thing out in, in a phased approach within, that, within phase one. But essentially, our principle as Department of Health is that healthcare workers are prioritized and we would really like to get them inoculated as soon as possible. Thereafter, the principle is that anybody who is in close interaction in, in, with, the, with people, so that is if you are a frontline worker, not healthcare worker, worker who interacts with people, or if you are, find yourself in a congregated situation for prolonged periods of time, then we prioritize you next. And then of course, those with comorbidities are also prioritized there. Now we are also we also often get asked, well, which comorbidity, do you have a ranking for comorbidities, et cetera? Not really. If you have a comorbidity, you're going to be prioritized um, in, 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 the, in the second phase. Um, and there's no comorbidity that's more important than another comorbidity. We have the studies, we know the studies. Yes, we know that obesity, hypertension, diabetes tend to be the comorbidities that are associated a lot with morbidity and mortality. But as far as we are concerned from a medical elderly, we need to be um, uh, prioritized. And then thereafter, in phase three, which will probably be the most complicated phase, we will then be uh, vaccinating over 18s who are um, healthy, who do not have comorbidities or any other risk factors. Um, the, the rollout and the service delivery models, we, we, I don't think we have the time to go over that, but suffice to say that after the phase one approach, which will essentially focus on work-based on, on work inoculation, we are looking at a diversified uh, model uh, to deliver the vaccines and inoculate. There will be inoculation centers in the workplace, there will be inoculation centers in facilities, healthcare facilities, there will be work in, in other facilities, community halls, churches, etc. cetera, um, and inoculation centers that are temporary structures, semi-temporary structures, and all of that. Basically, if we can put it 
and it's safe and get to inoculate you and we can have it registered on the EBPS system, we will, we will make every effort to try and bring inoculation as close to the people as possible. That is really the fundamental principle. In terms of staffing, we know that we have to staff uh, this, uh, the, the, this inoculation initiative, but we've been very fortunate that we've really had this coming together of all of the sectors and that has actually allowed us to pool those human resources and for all intents and purposes between community pharmacy, business, so i.e. occupational health, uh, which is based in business and the uh, and, and, and uh, multilateral organizations like your NGOs um, that do, do uh, health work, community healthcare workers, students. Uh, so that is the academic fraternity and of course the medical fraternity. We're really feeling confident, uh, community pharmacy, which is actually called as well as mental chain pharmacy. We really are feeling confident that the, the, all of that pulled together is actually going to give us the numbers to be able to inoculate. We already have a very robust inoculation program, which um, we, 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 we are building on essentially. Um, the final aspect that I just want to touch on quickly is the electronic uh, system. And essentially what, what, what everybody needs to know is that if you have a device, you will be able to self-register. If you don't have a device, we will register you. You see, I see that there are some reports that, that, that seem to allude to the fact that if you don't have a cell phone, if you don't have a device, or if you don't have access to this, that means that you're going to be left out and off. Uh, well, there are many people that we serve in the public sector who don't have those things, and they have been successfully uh, registered onto the health patient registration system. The health patient registration system is going to be interoperable and talk to the electronic vaccination system. And therefore, if you don't find us, we will find you. So um, there doesn't need to be any anxiety around uh, the, those members of the population who don't have access uh, to digital devices. Um, now, what I would like to do the, those members of the population who don't have access uh, to digital devices. Um, now, what I would like to do, is I'm going to just talk about the communications aspect because really that's the most critical aspect for us because that one will be our sink or swim. Now, communications um, has been dealt uh, with a number of blows um, and the problem with it is that um, without communications and without actually reaching the people, educating them on the merits of inoculation, educating them on the process of inoculation, and ensuring that actually get them to get to the facilities and inoculate. We will not achieve herd immunity, and therefore it will threaten our ability to recover on a socioeconomic level. Um, however, the communications for uh, vaccines has found itself severely constrained by the lockdown conditions. And this will be an issue the world over because these vaccines, the advent of these vaccines has come at a time when we are most of us experiencing our second waves. And, and this is very much true for Africa. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. And these are more reflections and thoughts rather than uh, myself uh, you know, imparting uh, you know, any, any ideas. It really is to jog all of our thoughts uh, on thinking about how we're going to handle communications and how we all need to work together to ensure that communication is accurate, uh, to ensure that communications is actually useful for our people and um, that it doesn't cause undue panic or undue misinformation. And at the end of the day, what we actually, I'm sure what we all want to achieve is we want to see people going to the vaccination centers and getting those jabs and, and for us to achieve herd immunity. So I'm just going to share a few thoughts. Now, uh, those of you who were there at the last webinar that I did for Africa webinar will remember that I started with uh, this video. And I'm going to just play the video quickly and then I'm going to talk about it because uh, it's, it's still quite critical to understand how we did communications before and what we're going to need to change. So let me just play it quickly. Oh dear.
Okay, so there's uh, several things to notice about this video, um, at which we don't see anymore today. So firstly, the big crowds, big crowds um, that our principal is interacting with, the touching, the feeling, the human connection, um, which really typified our communications as government before. But what I really wanted to point out is that things have, have turned upside down for us. Now, what government really got good at is understanding that we have large segments of our population who don't have access to TV, who don't have access to radio, who don't have access to digital communication. So even if they do, it's extremely limited because of their socioeconomic status. They don't have the airtime to be uh, the data to be uh, streaming webinars. Um, they might have a little bit of data to just exchange, um, you know, a few videos and, and voice notes and all of that. But essentially, we have a non-digital, non-linear segment of our population, and that is a very large segment of our population. So what did we do? We, was, we used to go there first, and we used to communicate the messages first there, and they would hear those messages first from us. And they would be the ones to then tell others what we said. So it would be Kabazela said, and he told me this, and I understand what he said because he was there. In fact, I can even show you a picture. I was with them, I took a selfie with them. After that, the digital and the linear population would then get the news because everything would flow from ground communications. Now it's all turned around. Now they hear from TV and from the digital space before they hear from us. This is what has caused the infodemia that we're experiencing and this is what is frustrating our communication uh, a campaign for COVID-19. But these are the people, the ones on the ground, the ones who don't have television, the ones who don't have uh, a, a data to be, to be able to uh, interact too much on the digital space that we really need to get to. But everybody else is getting to, to them first before we do. So what, are we, so what must we think about? So I think I've, uh, I've already uh, kind of uh, said what I needed to say uh, on this slide. So we, we're under level three lockdown at the moment and yet we have a crisis communication uh, issue that we need to address. We're not allowed gatherings. There's a lot of infodemia on social media and for the population that really has limited digital access, what we have found is that the voice notes that circulate um, on particularly on platforms like WhatsApp, et cetera, are really uh, the sources of a lot of infodemia. Now, those are the kind of things that can be exchanged by people of, who, who don't have a lot of money. They don't need a lot of data to do that. And we are finding that the, that, that kind of content goes very viral and it's a sensational type of content. Um, and uh, yes, uh, again, as I said, our poor reach of nation. Also, the fact that we have a rapidly evolving situation. So while we are still thinking about what needs to happen, while the science is still coming through, while the evidence is all still coming through, and we're still trying to figure it out while the regulators are working through all of the dossiers, there's already a lot of speculation um, and, in, and disinformation that uh, floats about before we have a chance to actually apply our minds. Um, in, in, in the, that is those of us who are in leadership and who need to communicate on the strategy for achieving herd immunity um, and by the time we do communicate there's been so much disinformation that we actually have a task of undoing it and it's very difficult to catch up with disinformation because anybody can just post a voice note without thinking without applying their minds anybody can write anything but we have a responsibility to think through uh, the things that we are aiming to achieve Uh, before we commit to uh, weekend and finally okay. And then of course, uh, there's politics that come into it now. Um, the Director General of Health, uh, Dr. Tedros, has repeatedly warned about politics, politicking, grandstanding, getting in the way of the global effort of COVID-19. And unfortunately, this is something that we see continuing to prevail. We've seen a lot of politicking around the variants, which is extremely unfortunate because the variants are actually supposed to assist us to inform us of the dynamics of the, of, of, of the pandemic, not to point fingers and to block people off and to start discriminating against various countries and various nations. 
seeing a lot of grants standing around uh, that kind. I'm just using that one as an example. There, there are other examples. And all of these uh, things uh, cause communication challenges, disinformation, confusion, and panic in the public instead of them being sources of information so that everybody is empowered to respond the way that we should all be responding as a collective. So the non-linear, non-digital tools that uh, we've been looking at, and, and really, I think this is an area as Africa, we really, really need to think very hard about and start really to um, innovate a lot in this space, uh, considering the restrictions that we are all operating under. And we will be operating under these restrictions until we achieve herd immunity, which we know is only a year away for the whole of Africa. It may be a, a little bit long. That. Now, uh, we uh, some of the things or some of the tools that we have been using here in South Africa are your loud hailing and your media trucks on the right. You will see a picture there of the UNICEF truck. By the way, all of the pictures that are posted, these are all uh, it, it, these are all uh, demonstrations of tools that we are using to uh, communicate uh, with people and to try and simplify the message as we go along with this pandemic. Uh, billboards, murals, and posters, food packaging, that we haven't used that so much, and I think it's, it'll be important. So not just food packaging, any packaging, really. Um, and I think it's important for us to actually uh, get together with business again and, and, and really talk about what, how they can help us with their packaging to deliver messages. And I think with food packaging, it's very easy to just plonk a very simple message you know, that encourages people to vaccinate. Uh, vehicle skins, uh, uh, skins and murals. We, we, we had a proposal for skins and murals for spaza shops and in, informal uh, traders and all of that, which I thought was, was fantastic. And we're going to be following up on, on that proposal. Um, the community screening and testing model was really great because we deployed 60,000 healthcare workers to do community screening and testing at the beginning of the pandemic. But they actually, it actually turned out to be a powerful communications tool because when they went into those households and they went door to door, um, they would they would educate people. This is what COVID nineteen is. These are the symptoms. Do you have these symptoms? Okay, if you do develop these symptoms, this is what you must do. Very very powerful uh, for the non linear non digital um, population, and we think that that probably should be used more. And then uh, we've had extensive uh, meetings and engagements with civil society, traditional leaders, uh, tra uh, traditional healers, religious uh, leaders, etc. And um, I'm very pleased that uh, as, as they have come to grips with the understanding of the vaccine to, uh, to, to assist us in, in ensuring that there is dissemination of, of correct information within churches, stockholders, community meetings, et cetera, all of that ground-based communication, face-to-face uh, -face communication, even if it's only in groups of 50, but at least those groups of 50 can conglomerate in principle to ensure that the message gets carried on. Work-based education, so the workspace is going to be really critical uh, to ensure that those who are uh, managers and directors in the workspace are empowered to be able to pass on accurate information to, uh, to, to, to their workers. Of course, in healthcare facilities, we, you know, we, we, we're quite good at uh, you know, putting up posters and little, t you know, there's TVs and, and a lot of the, of the facilities. So there's some uh, played contents that can be put there, et cetera. And that's going to be something that we're going to be leveraging off uh, quite heavily. But what's really going to be critical, and then we have had this feedback over and over and over again is leading by example. And this is not just political leaders, but the phase one, it's going to be very critical for us to ensure that our healthcare workers take up the vaccine. If our healthcare workers take up the vaccine, then that will build confidence in community members that, oh, okay, I know this nurse so-and-so, she took the vaccine, she's fine. Doctor so-and-so took the vaccine, she's my GP took the vaccine and he's fine. Um, and, and, and so it'll be, it'll be very, very important that those in healthcare leadership actually do uh, lead by example and take up the vaccine. And I see Nzinga is, is coming on, that means my time is up. So uh, just to once again say that the partnerships with the non-state players is really important. And I actually really just wanted to show you all the I, the I choose vaccination uh, uh, tool that we are using, which is gaining huge popularity. And you can download the Tribune on Twitter and on Facebook. And we'd really like you all to join us. And we also 
also have a, a we also have a WhatsApp group where there's really amazing conversations really around vaccination, but also around just other principles of social partnering and social solidarity. And I just wanted to say that webinars are, are, are a really powerful tool. There's a lot of spin-off that comes with webinars. And for those, for those populations who are in the digital population, they really are, I'm not gonna go through all of that, but they really are very powerful tool and we really should be using them more as we actually uh, communicate uh, during the lockdown period. Thank you very much. Uh, that would be the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzi. We're just trying to make sure that we have as much information as possible and also leave enough room for the Foreign Correspondents Association to be able to answer questions that they have. I'd like to now ask Professor Kole Gamlisana, who's the chairperson of the COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee, to make her presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And can I just assume that you can see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good good morning, everybody. And yes, uh, uh, Dr. Manzi, I am here actually. You know. Um, so uh, what I'm going to try and do because I think actually Loazi has touched on some of the issues I was going to raise. So I'm going to try and not take much time. So basically the question that we often ask, you know, what's the importance of vaccination? Why do we vaccinate? And I think everybody is clear that critically we want to reduce the infections and cases, you know, um, uh, of COVID-19. And secondly, we want to prevent morbidity and mortality. And as everybody keeps saying, we really want to make sure that by vaccinating as many, you know, members of the communities, we achieve herd immunity. And we all understand that now to reach that, we need to vaccinate at least at two thirds of the population. And because once we get herd immunity, then we're able to prevent ongoing transmission. And that's the only time we'll actually be able to turn around the tide of the pandemic. I thought I will start everybody with just understanding very briefly, you know, the basics of how do we get to vaccines. So basically, if you have a virus, as you can see here, and I think most of us have actually uh, sort of familiar with this, especially, you know, we used to talk a lot about this when you were talking, you know, during the HIV uh, epidemic, that what happens is that this is the virus, and this has been very clearly shown in many, you know, other webinars, in that remember the virus cannot exist outside a cell. So it requires to get into a cell, a human cell, if it's a human, you know, infecting virus, so that it then can, can, can replicate. So what it, what it does is that it attaches onto the cell. It uses these spike proteins to attach onto the human cell. And once mm -hmm. it attaches, it then releases its genetic material, the current, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, is actually an RNA virus. So you get the RNA released, and once that happens, it utilizes the cell machinery to replicate. And as it replicates, it then gets out of the cell. And now what then happens naturally is that when those vi new virions that are formed are released out of the cell, the body recognizes and the immune system of the body kicks in, in that it recognizes that there is a... A, a, a viral, you know, um, a, a antigen that's within the cell. And as it does that, the primary cells for immunity, these T helper cells, they actually stimulate two specific types of immunity that you may either, what we call B cell, which ultimately results in antibody formation. And when we talk antibody, if you have an antibody, then the antibody will actually act, interact with the virus, the newly formed virus, and you then get destruction. It actually neutralizes that uh, virus. So when we talk about neutralizing antibodies, that's what we're talking about. That's one kind of a specific you know, um, uh, immune system, I mean, immune response. The second one is where you find these cytotoxic T cells. Basically, these are cells that are able to destroy any antigen, any virus. So you have two types, either the B cell or the T cell, and that is what happens naturally. So when we then, you know, um, when vaccines are produced, the idea is to actually trick the body into producing virus looking like, you know, whether it's gonna be proteins, it's gonna be 
pieces of the of, of the virus so that the body recognizes these uh, structures that are formed be, you know because of the vaccine and then the body will kick in and then the body will kick in and will produce these antibodies and produce this cytotoxic cell killing so that at the end of the day the the individual can then respond whenever they get exposed to the to, to, to the infecting agent so that's basically what vaccination is all about and there are various kinds of vaccines really you know and they come in various forms and i know that people are often worried you know what are, you know what are the different kinds of vaccines you either take the structure the vaccine structure you inactivate it and you can use that or you can now with all the you know available genetic you know um, um, modifications you are able to actually just use a piece of or, or, of the protein or a piece you know of for instance there's one that's the mRNA vi vaccine that's available what that one does is that it's a, it's actually an information that then gets into the body tells the body to produce this vaccine I mean this virus looking proteins so that the body can then stimulate an immune response. So that's basically what this is all about. You know, this really is more like uh, showing, you know, I think somebody was mentioning that uh, um, uh, Loazi often talks about it, and it really is a success story in that we know that if you're looking at vaccine development, what we have known, it can take you anything up to 30 years sometimes to develop a vaccine. But because of the information that's available, advancement in technology, we were actually able to get, you know, to be talking about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine within 12 months of the, epi of the pandemic. And I think that is really something that needs to be celebrated globally. And, and, and people are often worried, you know, was this done properly? But I want to assure everybody, I mean, every step of the way, safety, if, for instance, we talk about the first phase, once we've moved from the, I mean, from the animal uh, phase studies, we come to the first phase, which is specifically looking at the safety irrespective of whether the vaccine uh, product uh, is going to do what we, we want it to do, but you're always concerned about phase, uh, I mean, safety in phase one, which is why you use very few numbers for phase one. And then once you are convinced, once you are convinced that there's no issues of safety, you then move on to phase two, which is usually about a hundred or so people that are, are tested. And that's where you can start to see, is this a candidate that we're testing, is it actually stimulating the responses we're expecting Expecting, you start to look a little bit on immunogenicity, but safety is still uh, paramount. And then phase three is then large populations over thousands. And what has actually happened is that why we're able to do this within such a short space of time is because, you know, with previous uh, studies, we, we realized that we could overlap some of the phases and that's how we're able to achieve this in such a short space of time. Right now, I'm just showing, you know, examples of just the six but, you know, vaccines that have actually, uh, uh, that are available, even though some of them may not necessarily, you know, uh, have uh, had uh, all the results, but really everybody is aware of the Modena and also the Pfizer. And these two actually have got a similar mechanism of action using the mRNA that I mentioned initially. So the issue when we're looking at any vaccine, it is always to see what about safety? If safety has been fine, the second thing, what about efficacy? How good is it? You know, is it going to generate the, 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 the prevention that we want to see happening? And so you're looking at this, I mean, almost all the candidate vaccines that are, we're talking about now, they have, you know, efficacy of 94%, 95%, yes, 62%, 79%. So really you can see that we've got good efficacy um, data in most of these candidates. Then the second, you know, the, the, the next thing you would look for, what about storage? Because obviously, depending on where you are based, now we're talking the African continent, and we know that we may not necessarily have the cold storage, you know, and the whole cold chain that, you know, some of these vaccines might require, which, which is why if you're looking at, for instance, the Pfizer one, the biggest challenge is that it requires to be stored at minus 70. And that's going to make it, you know, very difficult to actually be distributed to the, pro, I mean, to the, um, to, 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 to the continent as a whole because of the cold chain, you know, maintenance. But when you look at this one, this is the AstraZeneca uh, Oxford uh, uh, candidate. And this is the one that South Africa is getting, you know, hopefully within 
you know, within a few days, the minister yesterday told us that, you know, we're expecting the, 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 this uh, consignment to get to the country by the 1st of, Feb of February. The good thing about it is that actually you can store it in a normal refrigerator, 2 to 8 percent, uh, I mean, 2 to 8 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. Cyanofarm as well, good storage for our continent. And then, you know, even this one, Johnson & Johnson, we're just waiting for the results, and we're hoping that very soon we will have this available. So you can see that there's a wide spectrum to choose from. So what then are we doing? I thought for, 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 for my 